Welcome back, everybody, to the Fates Voyage Onward World's Open Qualifier. You guys just saw the round of top 16 where we had some, some fantastic matches, especially our prior match that we just saw at the end. Lobster, would you like to dig into that match Absolutely a little bit? Absolutely would. It was a nail-biter of a series which came down to this very, very clutch moment. The last big attack from Talpinator and choosing whether or not to commit the pre-commit the heroic refrain and also where to put it. And after a bit of thinking and analyzing, Gems, what you said earlier on was right. The heroic refrain buff, one of them should have hit the Teemo. Where the second buff goes, uh, doesn't really matter as long as that unit connects. If the Teemo survives, it's one more damage because only the Cat Maidens get removed, gets removed by the Tidal Invocation. And that means that, imagine Ultraman's Nexus is at 3 HP right now. This Teemo gets removed. Instead of playing the Mushrooms, we just play the second Teemo, play the Yumi on top, and it could have been lethal because it's an exact three damage hit to the Nexus. Of course, for us, it's easy to say with Caster Vision, we knew that Ultraman didn't have counterplay in hand, but I think at that point, Helpinator might have been able to have those reads as well because Ultraman's hand was very, uh, very small. The skip continuously gave information about the hand, stole the draw cards away, and Talpinator also kind of knew what options the Wise and Helps man has given. And it was only Formless Blade and Tidal Invocation, so not the right removal that Ultraman needed. Arguably could have taken this series here with some slightly more precise play, but this is the beauty of Legends of Runeterra. Some small inefficiencies can really just cost you the whole tournament run, and that's why so very often the better player actually prevails, or the one that currently plays better in that series. Yeah, I mean, that's what it always comes down to, and that is what is determining the rest of this bracket here. As you guys can see, everyone can see on the board, we have our top eight, Lulu Flippy versus Enzo Lecoco, which is our featured match here for the top eight. Sonic Holic versus Joker Age Sonic, we saw a little bit earlier on in the day against Painus, doing fantastically there. Ultraman, seen plenty of Ultraman's plays. He's been also doing fantastically, and obviously, Boxall versus Mike Check a country match off at the bottom there. A lot of interesting matchups here. What I love to see again is some of these lesser known names actually made it very far. And I'm going to be curious to see what they have been cooking up in the kitchen. What kind of lineups we will see that maybe hit the meta very effectively. Our featured matchup is going to be the very top one. Shlulu Flippy against Enzo Lecoco, the two with the lovely names. And we did see a glimpse of Shlulu Flippy earlier on. That was the series that ended right away when we joined the Spectate. So I'm actually going to be curious to see Shlulu Flippy in full action. A bit surprising to me, the last standing German representative. Just so many stacked players, stacked people already got kicked out in this incredibly dense tournament filled with high skill players. Yeah, I don't... No. No. That's for quality of play has been fantastic. And Enzo Lococo, we see here with the Nora Heimerdinger, the first one of the day. We've seen some other Heimerdinger uh, earlier on with Barco playing it. Again, another one of those decks that's really trying to prey, I think, on the sort of mid-range Demacia lists, uh, outvalue them, constantly generate tons of blockers with the Eclectic Collection, with Portapalooza, with Nora, with Junk Construct, consistent blockers, has options, obviously, Hate Spike, Soul Harvest is fantastic into formidables. Just, I think, a very solid deck. And it's a deck that we haven't seen in action yet, but I love to see it. It's very fun to play. It's very frustrating to play against. We'll see what the case is going to be here. Second deck is another elusive base deck. Timo Yumi, Bandle City with Piltover and Zon. And at first sight, I'm not really seeing any very surprising tech choices. Two Octo Adventurers to be able to take care of a lot of landmarks. Yeah. Again, very straightforward list that we saw rare in the previous round. And Shen Javan, again, one of those lists, decks that has been doing fantastically, especially in the open rounds, but we've yet to see today, really. Yeah, Shen Jarvan, a lot of people were high on this deck going into the tournament. I'm not sure if it underperformed in the open rounds or people just thought it would not be that good of a bring in the top cut. But at least one player here, Enzo, taking it all the way to the top eight so far. And let's see if the dominance can prevail. And again, another lane lineup not playing Janna Nila, but instead playing some off-meta choices like the Nora deck. 
Speaking of John and Ela, Shluli Flippy here, bringing the John and Ela uh, as one of their three decks. Has got a copy of Heavy Metal in their version and one copy of Aftershock. Um, the rest of the list looking fairly straightforward. Very similar to what we've been seeing in the past couple of rounds. Very strong deck, one of the strongest in the meta right now. And it's been doing very, very well for them. And Shlulu Flippy also a great pilot on this deck list, getting very far with this scouts is the second choice so arguably the two strongest or most winning decks going into this tournament are part of Shluli flippy's lineup kind of the philosophy of just play two or three good decks bring it to the tournament be comfortable with them and you're gonna get somewhere eventually if fortune is on your side yeah scouts as we've seen time and time again all the way going back to rising tides i mean the decks evolved since then it's now more champion strength board based but again fantastically strong deck and obviously and the final deck is the ujia galio version so going for the heavier formidable version we see the petricide charger the balan uh dran sculptor petricide hound and a lot of spells that's the spicy version that i think well, it's similar to the spicy version that we saw a glimpse of earlier on playing two dark and aegis as a uh weapon that can give your unit tough or that can be played for five mana to summon a challenger that increases the cost of your opponent's spell what's while attacking which is great in many of the current meta matchups we also saw a fair amount of removal three gentlemen's duels and one single combat so quite a bit of interaction i think that it should be fine face the likes of elusives and so on do you have any idea on what kind of bands to expect here? It's gonna if you're on Shluli Flippy's side looking at Enzo Lococo, it's gonna be very, very tough decision. I th you're gonna be slightly torn between Shen Javan, I think, and and Nor the Nora Heimerdinger. I think you're most likely leaving the team of Yumi up. I think your mid-range decks should do okay into it. You run a lot of challenges. Mm -hmm. Um it's not fantastic. They can still do a lot of elusive <laughs> damage to you, but it's 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 going to be tough in general. I think you're really going to struggle against potentially the SI deck, I think, with your scouts and your Ujia Galio. Mm -hmm. Again, another situation yeah. where there's no super obvious bans, and both players are taking their time here and probably thinking, if my opponent bans this, I should ban this. If my opponent plays the other, uh, bans the other deck, I should ban the other deck. A lot of mind games going on, a bit rock, paper, scissors like. We'll see who comes out ahead and which matchups. Are going to be played in a second yeah i think looking at this lineup i would favor enzo lococo overall i feel like they're in a prime position to um take a lot of these matches i feel like team Ayumi should do great into like something like scouts should mm -hmm. do pretty well into uji galio if as long as you have all those elusives constantly attacking i don't think they have a great answer to those a lot of the time um yeah, and even Nora Heimer is so effective at refilling the board, right? That you have so many blockers, you don't care that much about champion strength coming down as long as you can just chump block all of those huge units swinging at you. There, if we see that matchup, the biggest question is going to be can Shlulu Flippy find enough challengers to take care of key units like Nora and Heimerdinger? You have to also consider um, the Nora Heimerdinger list is running a puzzling signpost as well as a ruination. Ooh. And we do see the Nora Heimerdinger list come through, going up against the Formidables list of Shlulu Flippy. We're not quite sure what the bands were yet. We will probably see that soon. But Enzo Le Coco has an absolutely gorgeous opening hand for this matchup. Yeah, I would suspect that the potentially the Shen list was the ban, most likely. There's a, there's a, there's a, there is an option that it, it was the Yumi deck as well. There was there is a slight possibility, but it's, we'll find out hopefully afterwards. And I mean, it's a pretty good opening hand for kind of both sides. Mm -hmm. We do have an elusive blocker here, and the blocking badger bear on the flippy side can take care of Nora later on. Should that ever become a problem, and we were talking about challengers earlier on, the patricide broadwing is just the most effective way of doing though. Doubling down on the badger bear. But Lulu Flippy still needs a bit more of uh, combo tricks, maybe a Balin and a bit more mid-game units. Yeah, unfortunately this Broadwing, if Lulu decides to play here, is going to be just dealt with via the Quietus, which is a bit unfortunate. Um, Enzo is going to be super happy here. Um, they're going to get pretty good value removal there. 
for the board is even at this point and Angela Coco has some very effective units as well as very re effective removal options in hand. Now Schlüsselflippy is gonna start to run away on stat lines a little bit with the three mana four fours coming down. Another Pepperside Hound being drawn. Schlüsselflippy is now getting more and more desperate to draw these mid game cards. While Mark of the Isles is a perfect defensive option here, allowing the Conchologist to take care of the blocking Badger Bear. Yeah, three mana for three mana as well works out perfectly. As you mentioned, Junk uh, Construct here, fantastic. It's gonna just two two drops that again after they trade will then summon future units at some point to block more of the units from Shlili Flippy. again a lot of the deck is formidable so all these blocks actually review review actually reduce the damage output from Shlili Flippy's side too mm -hmm. and it's great for Enzo Lecoco that Shlili Flippy cannot or was not able to build a wide board yet because Shlili Flippy is heavily going to rely on this Galio buff all of those units to insane uh HP values, but more importantly, to get the Galio level up, which also implies a bunch of rallies. That is Shlulu Philippi's best chance at punishing through and breaking the line of defense of Endolecoco, which is going to consist of a ton of small blockers soon. Yeah, I mean, this hand again has the vengeance on Endolecoco side and has the hate spike, has even a Pytos. The uh, Pytos, by the way, being huge on the Galio turn because you can just pop the spell shield. And if you've set up enough mana, you'll have enough for, uh, hopefully, um, Pytos plus Ruination. That is actually a great spot. On turn 7, on the Galio turn, Enzo de Coco can just destroy the whole board right away in one action, right? You put Ruination and Pytos on the stack, and everything is going to be gone. Yeah, we've already seen, by the way, Quietus used earlier Ron. Um, Quietus, again, one of those key cards here, as well as Soul Harvest, as we <laughs> see now at the top. Uh, in removing, destroying either weapons or removing a lot of these uh, sort of the cheaper formidable units. Mm -hmm. okay, how is Shlulu going to develop? It looks like Petricide Charger into the weapon again, would be my guess. And then just setting up a Galio for next turn. Enzo Lecoco doesn't yeah, really I have plays. Looks like they are actually setting up this Pytos Ruination play. Not against... Oh, the, is that, this uh, is tricky. Oh, maybe it's just mind games. I really think Enzo Le Coco is going to be setting up this Pytos Ruination. Maybe putting something on the stack just to get Shlulu Flippy thinking. I do expect a Galio Slam here. Yeah, it's it's super tough because you know you, you know that Ruination, even um, without the additional spell, is going to spell trouble in general mm -hmm. for you. Um, but Ruination plus Pytos is going to be probably game ending here for Schlüter. True, but the attack is also not good enough, right? You also yeah. know your opponent plays cards like Hate Spike, Pytos, Vengeance, so they can also respond to your open attack at fast speed. <laughs> I think you kind of just have, have to bite down. Hope they don't have the perfect Ruination Pytos combo. And just go develop the Galleon. That's exactly what Schlulu Flippy does, and it's going to be met with just the Pytos for now. Maybe the Ruination is going to get saved and the Vengeance is going to come down to take care of that. I am mildly confused here. Yeah, I'm Would you get why we're not just saving the 9 HP? Are we forgetting something about spell ordering? It would have worked, right? Ruination and then... Yeah, Ruination is fast, fast speed. Yeah. yeah. What? Okay. I mean, we still got the job done. I guess we sacrificed 9 Nexus HP to the old gods <laughs> for better luck later down the line. And the portals are <laughs> starting to come down. Rebuild Anzo Lecoco's board, which is a luxury. It's that draw the two portals yep. as well. Yeah, that was lovely. And uh, that is going to be a very effective... Oh, the 0-5 blocker is actually juicy because Shlulu Flippy can threaten some big overwhelm hits later on with the stances of Udyr, but we now have a high HP blocker in that Bone Scryer and we have a Vengeance to take care of potential attackers. Do we just spirit some here? I'll be honest, I forgot what that spell does. I think, uh, it's, it's the, if, if I'm correct, it's the plus one, plus one to everything. True. Deal one to everything. 
Yeah, there would be an, op an, an option to develop your own game plan here. The weapon to keep Udi alive also kind of makes sense. We're probably going to have to be playing off of those big stun switches. The second Galleon Hand is nice. Put more fuel onto the board. We see that Enzo de Coco, at least with the Vengeance, can take care of one of those big threats. And I think at this point, Shlulu Flippy needs multiple big threats to eventually punch through and finish Enzo de Coco. Yeah, uh, the issue right now is obviously we can see in Enzo de Coco's hand, there is both the Wallop and a Vengeance, making it incredibly difficult for Shlulu to ever really achieve the big overwhelm goal um, at any point. And there's a second Vengeance here too. Galio does buff up Udir. The tag team is online, but the Pythos is going to remove the spell shield and open the way for the second, ve well, for one vengeance. And the second vengeance is eventually going to take care of the Udir. So, like you mentioned, that top deck coming in super clutch. Not necessarily right now, but it's so nice to have that security in hand and know that you can take care of the other big threat as well. Yeah, you're most likely going to vengeance the Udir to just stop any mana discount or generation. Um, depending on what actually the Flippy does here. Yeah, good point. Yeah. And then you can deal with Galio on the future turn. That's actually a very good point, just shutting down any value that Udyr can generate here, especially if that stance gets committed. I think you can even just put the Vengeance on the stack. You see how exactly Enzo de Coco is going to elect to do that. You can also wait for the Udyr to swing in. I think you wait for the Udyr to swing in to play around the weapon, I guess, being re-equipped from Galio. Good. Yeah, that weapon was played earlier on. It's yeah. very minor. And they'll be patient here. Playing the top deck Vengeance. On the right side of the hand. Glimpse Beyond to keep uh, the draw engine rolling. Prevent that Galio from inflicting any damage. And we see more portals popping up. Elusives do come out onto the board. Soothsayer is kind of useless. But Eclectic Collection, one of the interesting power plays and like, let's call it a delayed finisher. And it's going to find pretty, like some serious value here very soon with four units already being on the board. Yeah, and this is turning to be a really, really tough game. Yes, we see the champion strength here on Shlu Trippy, but we already know there is a puzzling signpost on the opposition side of Enzo La Coco, which will just shut that down at any point of the game too. Eclectic Collection does get played. I'm a bit surprised to see to not see uh, to not see the junk construct be played first, just for more triggers. But it's fine. Maybe we want to keep puzzling signpost mana up. Though I'm not quite sure if we would ever be afraid of champion strength there. This is the thing. Like champion strength is easily one of the best spells if not the, the best spell in the game but it's situational it's conditional it's only good if you already have a board and it's pretty useless if your opponent just has the line of blockers yeah it's also again as you mentioned situational because the only time it will become useful is if you can have overwhelm i guess with a single unit mm -hmm. but again you need a lot of like conditions to be right for that card to have its full effect yeah, and Enzo Le Coco effectively negated most of those conditions under which champion strength is a good spell. The Galio gets buffed up, but we already know that Enzo Le Coco has an answer here with the Vengeance. And even for the next attack that might come at some point, the Wallop will be able to take care of the card like Udir. Most of these champions close to leveling up. Udir here, two out of three stand swaps, but I don't think it's going to matter. The puff cap's already starting to rain in and pop damage. You can see the traps and boom counters on the right side of your screens right here. Flash bombs can be very nice against formidable units as well. But here we see Glimpse Beyond again, denying a stand swap generation. And Zola Coco making great use of those kinds of things so far. Gentleman's Duel coming in though with a reverse denial, let's call it. Yeah, I really like this gentleman, so it just obviously denies, um, will give you a stance swap, and also on top of that, denies the draw, um, which I think is the more crucial moment here. If you're Shlulu, you're, you're on the back foot for most of this game. Uh, you need to take any little bit of sort of advantage where you can, and uh, yeah, I think it's a fine play here, especially since they don't really have much else to do. Yeah, the hand from Shlulu Flippy is not allowing for a lot of options. It does feel good, though, to shut down the draw, don't get me wrong. We're technically now in a situation where if Enzo just has a few bricked top decks in a row, 
Lulu Flippy can outvalue them. If they find some, I don't know, like Balin, third Galio into some stances and so on, and then a big... I mean, Dark and Spear would also be a sick top deck here, just playing Annika, swinging in, pulling out another unit. So it's not over yet. And then... Yeah. But it's close. <laughs> yeah, because you could play Annika next turn and then get potentially Annika plus champion strength. That would be juicy. The thing is... Obviously, we know there's a signpost, right? So we know there's a yeah. available. It's only going to delay the champion strength by one turn because it gets bounced back into hand instead of completely denied. But the other thing is Wallop can also deny Annika's attack very effectively, prevent <laughs> it from pulling uh, further units out of the deck. Woodier does level up. First time we see that this tournament on the main broadcast. I think it's too little too late with all of the options that Enzo Coco has available, though. Yeah, just considering playing Jorau um, as a as a unit as opposed to the weapon, um, not I think it's fine. This screams like it's trying to set up champion strength from Shuli on this turn. What? And just trying to push for lethal. But we know obviously there's a ton of answers. There's enough answers yeah. on the side there's of Enzo. Wallop, there's signposts. I mean, Shlulu Flippy is doing well playing through their wing conditions here, especially with the Sky Splitter in hand. Udyr would go up all the way to, what, 16 attack? And that would be exact lethal, even punching through the Bone Scryer, even though it would be punching through the high HP blocker. But we do see the wall. I love this. Shutting down. I love this. I love the wallop way more than the puzzling side post. It removes the champion strength as a problem. It also sets up and an it's attack, gone. interestingly enough. It also makes sure that Shlulu Flippy has one less blocker here. So maybe Enzo Lococo with this wallop is setting up a lethal right away. Limps Beyond probably going to come out here. Yeah, going to try to search through the deck a little bit more. It is an expensive Glimpse Beyond thanks to Jarrell's ability. Um, hits some healing, <laughs> which is going to be uh, potentially really helpful here, considering how big Uchi is getting. And Noro should be levered at this point and can... Well, the attack already did go through earlier on. And uh, Shlulu Flippy now left in the same position, trying to set up a big attack. Now, it it was not the easiest of plays to make, right? Now you, you're missing the wallop. You could have had a wallop in hand instead of a puzzling signpost, but then your opponent would still have had the champion strength in hand. It's an interesting trade-off. Both have some big ups and downs. You would have had an additional draw as well from the signpost. True. That's something to consider. Ooh. Okay. But Shlulu Flippy did not find any further attack buffs, did not find any other champion strength or any other shenanigans. Doesn't need to, can just develop Nora here, can just develop more portals and hope to try and see what the portal randomness is going to provide. Mm -hmm. It's back also not a bad option to get rid of that Jural as a blocker. Of course, we know though, Shulu Flippy has Sky Splitters for defensive reinforcement. Nora's level up animation coming through, also something we haven't seen this tournament yet, but this is gonna really snowball the pressure of Enzo Le Coco, boosting all of those portal generated units in mana cost and making them stronger, beefier, and more threatening. Okay, this is a very, very tough time because obviously Nora. Nora and the subway works are going to push for four as well, just pure intensive damage. So it's something to consider. Oh, just going. They tapped out under the champion strength, right? So they just realized they can play the eclectic. Exactly. Game. I really like this. I don't think we need puzzling signpost mana anymore. We don't care if our opponent plays single combat or another gentleman's duel. And it is being rewarded right away, spawning two units and putting a third one into the hand. Funny enough, Ooh. more puff caps going into hand, and we already know there's a bunch of puff caps in Shlulu Flippy's deck. This attack is wide, this attack is threatening. Is this attack going to be lethal? So you have to block absolutely everything. Technically, wait, you can push. How much? No, uh, hate spike, double hate spike. Double hate spike the Udyr, but then Sky Splitter is dangerous. Yeah. I think that would be a very risky play. I think Enzo Le Coco doesn't... Well, but Enzo Le Coco is in a position where they want to remove Udyr at this point because yeah. they're not going to survive another Udyr swing. 
does let it go through and then it probably is going to follow up with the hate spikes but we know that the double sky splitter plus the stand swap is going to have wow wait Shulu flippy is back in this game just because there was no lethal threatened i mean we have to see what portals also appear as well right True. there's still a quite a few other portals um, there's a chance of a of how many vengeances were in the deck. So we've seen there are three vengeances. We've seen two. That's an eight-eight blocker as well. You can also just play the shrooms. Yeah, you can just play the shrooms. There are a lot of shrooms in yeah. Shuli Flipper's side now, especially with the eclectic. This a... it's going to be so draw dependent. I mean, how many cards does Shuli Flippy have left? It's probably like twenty-five ish. So on average. They're only going to draw like one, one and a half damage. It's very unlikely that yeah. this is lethal. It's very unlikely for Nora deck to top deck any lethal here. I'm not sure if there is even any option. And now the Udyr is punching through, even finds the three sisters. Only one puff cap drawn. Shkulu Flippy is sitting comfortably at 2 HP. And the portal only pulls a 5 HP blocker. I think this is game. That's Wait, game. no. Yeah, the... if, if Shkulu Flippy goes for Fury of the North. It's, it's game without without it right all right it's already pushing seven it's, it's 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 more than enough that is just it there's no answers on enzo's side and you see yeah this i think this goes back to the there was a turn i think they vengeance scaglio instead of Ujia, right true that was one of the key reasons but also i cannot help but think that the last turn was a strategic misplay because if you're not threatening lethal that turn like, Enzo Lecoco already kind of knew their deck just doesn't run any finishers anymore, right? Mm -hmm. They're not going to get the win anymore until their next attack. And they could have also known they can't stop the next Utir attack. I think you kind of had to commit those hate spikes on the attack, or at least after the attack to finish off Udir. Of course, we knew, like in hindsight, double Sky Splitter would have saved Udir anyway. It would have not made a difference. But at least, like, I feel like Enzo Lecoco could have at least played to their outs a bit better and also going back to one of the to, to turn seven right mm -hmm. remember when we sacrificed nine hp for the old gods and yes. it didn't yeah. really pay off it did not give us the luck we needed yeah i think that was also a huge uh, turning point because they probably would have still been alive that turn yes the udir would not have been able to otk like yeah it was just an overkill by two here imagine we had nine more hp we would have been chilling it's so it's a close game. We are far into the tournament. Nerves are kicking in. Both players are probably a bit mentally fatigued. Us casters surely are a bit mentally fatigued with all of the high-level Runeterra action that's been going on. So it's normal to make mistakes, but it does feel like Enzo Lecoco had a fair fighting chance. It was... The, they they kind of had the game in their hands, but Shlulu Flippy just barely edging it out and slipping through with a win here. Yeah, and this is again, now we have scouts up against uh, the same deck we saw previously, the Heimerdinger and Nora. Um, but you look I at don't, the bottom right. I don't, like, I, I, I don't like that trade. Oh, Ultraman won. Okay. Yeah. First of all, congrats to Ultraman making it into another top of four. I think that should already assure a world championship spot if he didn't have any yet. He might have been qualified before already, right? Ultraman has been widely successful in this year of Legends of Runeterra. But congrats to Ultraman making it into the top four. Further into the prize money and into the points. Going back to this game, strong Nora okay. start after Bird. Yeah, this is a very, very interesting turn. Um, so, Shulu Fippi, I think one of the first things I noticed was the block with the Fleet Feather Tracker. Mm -hmm. uh, wasn't a huge fan of it because you have Inspiring Light. You also lose your Challenger unit for Nora um that's kind of one of your only ways to really deal with it did get misfortune here um unfortunately you can't really play misfortune here because soul harvest just kind of removes it and well pablo is huge here <laughs> from the portal hitting from nora after the first hit yeah setting up a prize fight marai warden instead and still keeping mana for inspiring light i, I very much like this like misfortune being removed would have cost a lot of tempo but here, this just makes the board so wide that it's very hard to take care of on Enzo Lecoco's side. Yeah, um, the only issue I have is, again, if we go back to that private's previous turn, they would have kept that Fleet Feather Tracker here, which would have posed a threat for Nora. I was just going to touch up on that as well. I totally agree. 
on that assumption. I think we can take the two damage. I think we're not scared of an unbuffed bird, the bell ringer. Um, we did lose a challenger here. I think part of the so thought process might have been like Enzo Lococo plays a bunch of pie tosses and other effective removal spells. I think we can take that risk, but either way, now the Nora will generate a bunch of portals unchecked. Yeah, and there's a pretty favorable blocks here as well from Enzo Lococo. The, the Pablo here is fantastic. And Nora as well. This is the thing. Nora is free to block, right? There is no like direct damage coming out from scouts outside of two MFs. Two misfortunes on the board generating like a um, make it rain. So I think you're super safe to block there. Take the value blocks, generate another portal here. Looking really, really good for Enzo. High mid can come down really freely. Uh, this is going to spiral very out of control very quickly. Yeah, but the, the Broadwing does take care of Heidel, uh, of Heimer Dinger very effectively with MF support. But we do know that Hate Spike is here. Nora does get sacrificed because she is eventually going to die anyway. It's just too important to get rid of the MF and to keep Heimer Dinger alive. I love that play by Enzo Lococo. Yeah, recognizing Nora's kind of done her job at that point in the game, right? Um, Nora's not really going to get that much more value. It's probably going to block on the next turn. Might as well just remove, remove MF. Oh, and Quiet is being found taking out the Petrocyte Broadwing. And just like that, the Skull Stack is running out of steam. Enzo Lococo finding a bunch of early cards and just grinding the Skull Stack out of units. Yeah, this is looking very, very tough now for Shlulu. I think a couple of key decisions in the first early game. Um, I think it goes back to the discussion I've seen going around on social media where uh, you have the, is it a control deck or is it an aggro deck or mid-range deck? And that mindset of playing it more like a more of a combo, so, sorry, more of a combo deck, not control, um, would really have helped Shlulu here in terms of building that effective board. Inspiring Light would have been way more threatening. Um, Nora wouldn't have had a chance to potentially be as uh, much of an issue. It would have forced Enzo, I think, into more difficult yeah. decisions. Maybe, Who knows? maybe there wouldn't even have been a hate spike target to take care of the MF. Mm -hmm. But here we are now. Shlulu Flippy does go for a valiant effort here to put some pressure out on the board. But it looks like the Heimerdinger is just going to be creating some runaway value. Mark of the Ice does get popped onto this hyper buffed turret, which means it's gonna sacrifice its life, but gonna take out the island navigator in return. And Shlulu Flippy, just three units on the board, no cards in hand, and we know Enzo Lococo is holding a ruination, plus additional refill here with a glimpse beyond. This looks over. <laughs> Yeah, which is exactly what Enzo wants, right? So Enzo had that first sort of more rough match. Uh, really probably happy to see this happen. This turn hit the, uh, the assassin to draw an additional card off the portal. So this is looking well, fantastic. This is a redemption, getting that win on the Heimerdinger back. Aitos taking care of the elusive. The only threat left that can actually kind of punch through Enzo's defense here. Although the Shadow's, uh, Shadow Assassin was also an amazing find off the board. Yeah. Collector Collection, adding insult You're not injury. scared of champion strength at all at this point. You just block a few times. With all the exactly, <laughs> that's the board state that we mentioned while we looked at the deck list earlier on. You don't care about champion strength anymore. And also, Shlulu's board is just not wide enough for that matter. Yep, can see the elusive damage now coming out. It's going to try and finish off the game in one more attack turn. Really sort of rush this down. There is champion strength, but again, one turn too late. If we even see a committal of champion strength, you can either just choose to either block or just play Ruination and get an 8-8. Yep. <laughs> the scouts has no interaction, no way of stopping it, and it would be an open attack on the next turn. Yeah. There's unfortunately just no win condition left for Shlulu Flippy that can still punch through everything that Enzo has already put up. This Heimerdinger has put in some work. So many 1-1s. One -one it's just that it, Scouts hates it without MF on the board. It's just, they're just stopping so much damage. And that's kind of all you really need to do for, for these matchups. And it's really frustrating to deal with as a Scouts player because you, you you're basically trying to set up that big champion strength turn so you really can't afford to make 
uh, even the slightest sort of misplay in the first like three to five yeah, turns. Yeah, you do need to snowball your board and maybe some slight mismaneuvering on Shlulu Flippy's side here, giving up the tracker. Mm -hmm. But Enzo Le Coco also just completely dominating this, running away with this game. And the last matchup we are gonna see is the elusive aggro deck on Enzo's side versus Shlulu Flippy's scouts. Do you have any experience on this matchup, Gems? Uh, I've played similar matchups in previous metas. Um, it's a very close matchup. Again, if you have like your couple of challenger units earlier, your Broadway, and, um, a couple of other like Fleet Feather Tracker, nice. uh, you can hope to try and remove some of it. But sometimes you can just overrun them. If you just go wide, play Inspiring Light, um, they might have only one big tall unit right on their side, whereas but the rest of them not going to be so much. They could be very small one ones and two ones and one twos. Exactly. Like basically both decks are gonna try to go very wide. But because Enzo's deck plays elusive units, they're gonna be slightly understated, right? The keyword comes at a bit of a cost. And that means Shlulu Flippy is gonna have a higher damage output if both decks just develop effectively. And that means that Shlulu Flippy is gonna threaten to close out the game earlier and gonna make Enzo Le Coco force basically force blocks out of the elusive decks. And then you don't even need Challenger anymore, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, love this turn here. Um, what if, if you're Shlulu, you have a couple of options. What you really want is to set up that Inspiring Light for the following turn. Um, so your options really are just Shell Shocker, and then you would have the three mana from that you float with Island Navigator on four, which is looking to be a big turn turning point here in this matchup. Yeah, that is so big. Skip whiffing on the Island Navigator as well as the Aspiring Light. Pretty big. And the card that Skip pulled can be returned very soon here once the Fleet Feather Tracker does get buffed. Can trade into the Skip. I would you say also this no looks... hurry. You're no yeah. hurry for Genevieve, right? That's the thing. There was Genevieve that got taken. You're in no rush because you can't play Genevieve yet at this point. Oh. <laughs> Loses the board. Single... Yeah, a bit, too, a bit unfortunate there with the Scout unit hit. Um, could have maybe gotten like even a 2-2 two -two would have been nice. Oh, yeah. oh skip. the second skip takes care yeah. of the Inspiring Light and all of a sudden this looks much closer than it just did. But still, the Fleet Feather Tracker can take care of this skip because it's unbuffed. But it does take a lot of steam and a lot of power out of this very attack turn. Yeah, it completely removes what would have been a very scary attack turn um, from slowly happening this turn to... Um, pretty sort of average attack turn, I, I would say. Yeah. I'm a bit surprised to not see a full swing here. I think what Shlulu could go for is to just trade one or two units out and then play Quinn, summon the Valor, and then play the Inspiring Light, just to have some slightly higher value targets. But here, yeah, right... not against that. Um, you would have to probably keep your scout units, maybe attack with sh the Shell Shocker. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we could have attacked with the scout unit. The only value block that Enzo Le Coco can do is to block with the 2-3 skip. And that means that, again, we can target that one with the Fleet Feather Tracker as well, get the Genevieve out. Um, it's also not bad. But this this line of play from Enzo Le Coco also makes a ton of sense, putting some pressure out and clearing out some space so that Quinn can summon Valor and all of those can be buffed by the Inspiring Light. We will also have four scout units available and we did find the champion strength off the top of the deck. Yeah, that's going to be a huge next turn. So you're going to have, you're going to, so if you want a champion strength, can you play, you can't play Inspiring Light this turn, can you? Yeah, but I think we're not in a rush. We would rather play champion strength in our opponent's turn anyway. But I think we could even not play Inspiring Light. We could go Sergeant for the Master, uh, but then we don't have champion strength mana on turn seven neither. I think you have to pressure blocks here from Enzo Lococo in some fashion. Absolutely. Another champion strength that is overkill. Just going for the champion strength before. I mean, the most strength. of the units have scout already. Yeah. Most of the units have scout, so you get two attacks with this big ass white board. So I, I don't know. The, the, the top deck blowback, though, will actually be a big problem. One unit can choose to remove yeah. the valor, right? Exactly. So that stops, val that stops the value trades. Coming in very clutch, the blowback only discarded. I didn't quite see if it was one or two cards. Two card, uh, One card discarded, two damage is going to 
be put onto the playing field here. The three scout units swing in. And so the Coco can take some damage. They can comfortably go up down to like one or two Nexus HP, knowing that only MF can directly damage the Nexus in the scout deck. Sending off some of these weaker scout uh, elusive units here on blocking duty. And now the full swing comes in. Yeah, you have to block three of no, Technically two only two. Only the question is, one. are you fine yeah. with staying on one Nexus HP? Yeah, completely fine, I think, right? I would agree. In this matchup? Because if you're Enzo Lococo, you're looking to win the very next turn, right? There's no answers for the elusives. There's no badger bit bears that we've seen. There's no interactivity in scouts at all. Yep. There's no, like, combat tricks that you're scared of. I, um, I mean, I, I will say just swing it. this was pretty slick by Shlulu Flippy. Banking one spell mana. They set up another champion strength turn for this very turn. But Enzo Lococo just realizing there's no interaction, like you said. Buffing up the elusive, swinging in immediately, not giving any chance to play the second champion strength. And that means that Enzo Lococo, on just one Nexus HP, does defeat Shlulu Flippy and make it into the top four. Yeah, the only punish would have been... Uh, maybe if there wasn't an open attack and somehow scouts managed to get two mfs in some <laughs> that was not never going to happen with a single uh with a yeah with a single draw and no mfs in hand right and make it rain yeah. for lethal but yeah i don't know there was there's, there was no real like scary answer there at all on yeah. the side of scouts that's kind of the, that's the big downside of scouts is the lack of like strong interaction with your opponent's game plan yeah in this very last game, I really like the, the play of Enzo Lococo, realizing that it is perfectly fine to dip down to one HP because you are threatening the lethal on the very next swing and also playing to that win condition and just not giving your opponent any opportunity to come back into the game. And with that top four player already having advanced, we jump over to Sonic, Holic versus Joker, and we finally see the Shen Jarvan deck in action. And we see a leveled up Javan <laughs> with a Cataclysm available too. So this is, uh, if you're on Sonic's side, this is not looking pretty good, especially since your hand is pretty unvaluable. It's just a Durand and turn eight and maybe a Dural. We are coming in at a very interesting time point of this game already, having seen this level Jarvan. And again, the champion strength in Sonic Holic's hand, technically enough mana to play it, but it's just not effective here because all of the units on the side have been taken out. Only a Balin rallying does not do enough, and we do see the surrender come out. And that was already the third game. Sonic Holic, unfortunately, is going to part ways with us here. Drops out in top eight. Nonetheless, a strong showing, made it into the prize money, and also collected some important Runeterra points. Yeah, unfortunately, we didn't see how the game got to that state, so we can only make assumptions. But again, congratulations to Joe Courage uh, for winning that matchup against Sonic. Sonic is a fantastic player who we've been seeing time and time again uh, doing fantastically in tournaments. So they, they should be super excited about this result and getting as far as they have in the tournament. And interesting to see which kind of decks both players played. The first round was again a an elusive mirror, right? Because one was playing Bandle City Freljord elusives, the other one Bandle City PNZ elusives. Here, PNZ version actually won. I think that is rather a bit uncommon, but if you get a very good tempo start, if you annoy your opponent with skips, and if you find that burn lethal, that is definitely very doable. You just go under your opponent and you try to overrun them quickly, basically. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic showing from both all this, all those players. Uh, we are going to be hopping to just another break very shortly, and when we're back, we'll have more Runeterra action, so don't go anywhere. <laughs> 